Hey folks, it is September 19th and we're here with the Proto School Weekly Call. We just have a few quick updates today. Um, so on the content development front, I have been working on our plan for integrating IPFS camp content into Proto School. So you'll find an issue in the notes that you can follow if you'd like to join in on that discussion. Um, I've gone through and made some proposals for the content from the course on understanding how IPFS deals with files. And then that's a process that I'll be continuing to go through on um, each of the other, each of the other core courses at least, although there may be content from other forms of presentations that we want to include. Um, and then Jill, you want to share what you're up to on the content front? Sure. Uh, I've been working on, uh, I mean, I started working on the new tutorial on non-mutable file system file API. So it will be like um, the, the equivalent to the, the tutorial that we already have for the mutable file system, but for the, the regular file API. Awesome. So that's in progress. There's a link also, um, if you want to add the link there, Joel, to the, the issue yeah, yeah. for that one, in case anybody wants to see what the, what the progress is like or what the plan is. And then um, Dan Shields had found a bug. He submitted us a very specific uh, wrong answer to one of the lessons and it got hung up in, like it just wasn't evaluating at all and returning an error or a success message. Um, so I spent some time looking into that with someone on the IPFS team and we discovered that it is indeed a proto school problem, not an IPFS problem. Um, and it's something where we should change the way that we're doing our evaluation, both in that particular lesson, there's like a conditional missing that we should include, but also we should do some work under the hood so that we can distinguish between this is an error that's coming from IPFS or this is an error that's coming from the code that you wrote where you were missing a parentheses or whatever, um, or this, the function you wrote is not returning a value at all, which in currently we have lessons that don't require that when we don't need that, we don't need them to return something for purposes of our validation. So there are a few different angles we can attack it from and Alex will add a note in that issue so that we can then um, tackle that one. But that was a good find, Dan. We'll be with you soon to fix that one. Um, and then, uh, no new chapters this week, but we have a couple of efforts underway in terms of planning. So there are, there are Q3 OKRs we're working on scoring. Um, obviously we spent a bit of time working on onboarding when we left Yogo and gained Jill. So that is completely expected. We won't get through everything that we had planned, but we've done a great job of focusing on our, our most pressing issues. And then Q4 plans are in the works, which will include a lot of work to take the content from IPFS camp and apply it both in, you know, tutorial, new tutorials, updating existing tutorial content, etc. Um, so there is an, um, there's a link here to the draft of those OKRs if anyone's interested and we can share them officially once they're locked down. And then the one other thing I just wanted to share, which I will share my screen for for a moment, is um, I just wanted to share a quick update. I took a minute to go through some of the the metrics that Diogo and I added earlier in the quarter with about like a maybe a three week window of actual results from them. So just to kind of share the, what we're capable of doing now, we have um, now the ability to look at stats like the completion of a lesson or tutorial, whether people are using that reset code button, pass versus failed attempts, the wrong choices that they're picking in multiple choice, et cetera. Um, so we have a lot more functionality than we used to, and we're also sort of protecting users a bit more by avoiding Google Analytics. So just a few things at the moment. This is just from August 21st to September 17th that this data is from. So not a huge um, span, but just wanted to show that we have a, you know, we have the ability to track sort of our inbound traffic, how many visitors we're getting, new visitors, et cetera. 
We've been doing some work to improve linking between ProtoSchool and other docs. So you'll see, for example, we added a button on ipfs.io to encourage people to use ProtoSchool. And you can see what our main traffic sources are. A lot of it is the IPFS website directly, also the docs website, um, where we've done a lot of increased linking. GitHub, this may be from you know, repos on the files on the MFS API, for example, where we would have also dropped a link into ProtoSchool. And um, so you can see kind of where traffic is coming in. But another thing that's nice that we can do now is look at what people are choosing to click out to. So whether that's a link to specific documentation in a lesson or these resources pages that we have now at the end of lessons, we can see which of the resources we presented is most interesting to people to go explore further. So we have that. And then this is just a sample of the kind of data we can collect about a lesson. Um, so what I was expecting is that within a tutorial, so for example, in the top right here, you see the blog tutorial, and these are the numbers of the lessons. So this is what I would expect, that you'd have like a bunch of people would finish the first one, fewer would finish the second, et cetera, and the least would finish the last one. Um, and then when I looked at the MFS tutorial, it was very different. Now notice that these aren't exactly in order, but this there's a huge drop off here between people who complete the first lesson and people who complete the second. Um, and then there's also this distinction, which my theory right now is that this is about having a text-based lesson as the first one in that tutorial versus then we get down to the coding challenges. And after we're in the coding challenges, it looks a lot more like you'd expect it to be. Um, but then we also have this distinction we can look at in the height of these graphs, notice they're on different scales. So these aren't, that you can't judge based on the height, but we can see how many people have completed a lesson, but we can also see how many times incorrect code was submitted or people use that code reset button. So for example, for MFS lesson two, we had 114 successful code submissions, but 292 incorrect code submissions and three times that someone pushed that reset code button. So it's about 28% of all the attempts that are made appear to be successful. And that's the kind of thing that we can track to try to figure out whether a lesson is too hard. And to be fair, it's not a bad experience to have your code fail. Hopefully we've provided good error messages. So they're, they're learning something as they go, we hope. But, um, and then we can see kind of the overall stats for the site of how many times the lesson was passed. This includes the text only lessons for this stat. And then the bottom two stats are about just the code, um, the code base challenges. And then this is just if we compare um, looking at the existing tutorials, which the data structures one is purely reading, there's no code in it. You can see that the completion rates here. So this is people who landed on the, the landing page for the tutorial. It's kind of like the table of contents um, and people who made it through successfully completing every tutorial, every lesson within the tutorial. Um, but then I wanted to break that down a little bit further because I think we're going to have a big drop off between people who land there and people who get through the first lesson because they actually have the skills. For example, they they do actually know JavaScript so they can keep going. So on this MFS lesson, the first one is reading. So I'm really going with the second lesson here to get this stat. But you see that we keep, and this bump up is because not everyone will get there through the tutorial page. They might land right into the first lesson. But if you take it from, you know, people who complete the first lesson, this is that compared to people who got to the landing page. And then people who complete the entire tutorial, you're looking at like a reasonably high, a reasonably high rate for most of these of getting through. But this lesson from, from landing on the, that landing page to getting through the first lesson, there's a big drop off when you switch to JavaScript instead of the reading. Um, and the completion rate overall is much higher for that reading one. Now that might mean that reading is easier than coding or more of our audience wants um, not code challenges or doesn't know JavaScript, but it also might mean people are interested in conceptual stuff more than they're interested in the IPFS APIs or something like that. So this is just, mostly I'm just sharing it as a look at the kinds of data we have access to with the new metric system, um, as opposed to proposing what exactly is going on um that causes those specific results but just a sense of the kinds of things we can do now now that we've had a time to collect a little bit of data and i think we'll also see that the 
in terms of like the visitors to different pages, you know, which tutorial is getting the most traffic, that's going to change a lot also based on the events that are happening. So in a month where somebody runs a live event in Seattle and uses the MFS tutorial, we're going to see a lot more hits there than we would at another time. So um, that's just a taste of something that is kind of past work that we're resurfacing now that we have a chance to evaluate it. Our, we had a lot of um, kind of false data being collected at the time we were building the feature because all of the visits from local hosts were included. So it's just kind of since then that we've been able to separate out our local host visits from the live production visits. So now that should be fairly clean data uh, moving forward. Um, anything you wanted to chat about, Jill, today? I don't think we have any other big updates. No, for me, it's pretty much that. Cool. So um, I am traveling for the next couple of weeks, and Jill's going to be digging into some code, some content creation while I'm out. So we're actually going to be missing our, this meeting won't happen on September 26th or October 3rd, and then we'll be back on October 10th. Um, so I will update the invite in the community calendar, and I've already noted that in the GitHub issue for this call, but I look forward to seeing people on the 10th. And as always, the agenda is linked to you from the, um, from the meeting invite, so feel free to add any agenda items that you want to chat about on the 10th, and we will see you then. Thanks, everybody.